Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is uh, Ansar Faza. I'm the, as, as you already said, I'm the Director of Public Health for Oxfordshire. I've been in Oxfordshire for just over three years now. Um, uh, good to see some familiar faces. Uh, um, uh, so I started about six months before the pandemic. No one told me there was going to be a pandemic when I started, but there you go. Um, we've, been, we've been training for this. Um, and uh, uh, I uh, just a bit of bit of, bit about myself. So I, I was I was qualified as initially as a pharmacist by background nearly about twenty one years ago. Um, I worked in uh, uh, clinical settings. I was one of the first non medical prescribers in uh, within the pharmacy settings uh, in West Midlands. Um, and then naturally, I kind of went down the route of uh, um, public health, um, uh, which is where my real passion was. Um, I then worked in some of the most deprived areas of West Midlands in the Black Country, in areas like Sandwell. Um, I was the interim director of public health there for a little while, and then I took on my first role here in 2019. So that's that's a bit about me. Um, I'd like to just check: is, can everyone hear me all right? In the, in the, what about just give me a thumbs up or anything like that in in the Teams channel, just to make sure everyone can uh, everyone can hear me all right in the Teams channel. Yeah, I've got a hands up uh, from. Uh... Okay, that's. A, I'm, I'm assuming that's a thumbs up. <laughs> right. Um, excellent. Uh, right. Okay. Um, just minimise that. Right. Okay. So I've got a lot of slides in, in, to present today. So my aim is is to kind of give you an introduction of what public health is, make a case for prevention. Um, the first half, I will, I will, I will do two sets of slides talking about some of the basic principles of system working and why we need to work on systems. So some of the things might be really, really basic for some of you. So just bear with me. Um, and then the second part, we'll pause a little bit, just give you a couple of minutes if you want to reflect a little bit and ask any few questions around it. And then the second half, we'll talk a little bit more about Oxfordshire because it would be remiss of me not to talk about Oxfordshire as being the director of public health Oxfordshire. So um, let, let's take it in that order. And I want to particularly talk about some of the hidden inequalities that we see in, 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 in within Oxfordshire, which is considered to be one of the affluent part of the uh, country. Um, but before that, can I just take a show of hands? Um, has um, anyone here from a public health background? Oh, hi. Brilliant. Excellent. Okay. Uh, is anyone who's been through kind of uh, recently been through lectures around or, or had any kind of seminars on population health or public health recently? You two are not allowed to lift your hands up. Okay, there you go. Brilliant. Okay. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> so, um, so let's let's go through the presentation and and see. Uh, feel free to ask any questions if there's kind of uh, emerging questions as I do the presentation. Um, so let's take it in those two parts. So, uh, starting with, as I said earlier, I will talk about some of the determinants of health, basic principles of system working and systems and structures in the first part, and then I'll take the inequalities and uh, uh, talk a little bit about system working in practice. And I particularly want to talk about inequalities as well as the healthy place shaping which is an approach we have taken in Oxfordshire. And I think it's a really pioneering approach we've taken, particularly in Oxfordshire, to try and take a preventative approach for tackling health inequality. Uh, okay, determinants of health. Just quick, as I said, I'm going to start with really basic stuff here. So I'm going to talk a little bit about life expectancy. Any idea of what our current sort of life expectancy is? Average, currently. Sorry? 86, a little bit high. Any other guesses? Look, yeah, around 80. But what has it done over the last 30 years, do you think? It's, it's gone up. It's, it's gone up, obviously. But what's happened the last kind of 10 years? It's kind of stalled, exactly. It's kind of stalled. So a um, little bit about life expectancy, considered to be the number of years you expect to live from birth uh, to, to, uh, to, to, to death. Um, and that is uh, back in 1981, we're looking at about 70 for male and 76.9 for female. So it's gone up for both male and females in 2014, but the last 10 years have really, really kind of tapered and pandemic has taken a dip downwards as well. So, uh, so we've seen kind of life expectancy gradually going down. So that's life expectancy. Um, and, uh, and I think one thing to also point out is that 
you know, just think about in that 30 years where the life expectancy has been added. Has it been added at the latter end of life, middle or front? So that, that kind of thinking. So, you know, and actually I would say vast majority of the life has been added right at the end of people's life, thanks to medical technologies and things like that developing. OK, so that's life expectancy. Um, population projection. So what I just said, I just asked the question, where do you think that life is added? It's added very much. You can see there uh, in terms of population projection for 65 to 84 and 85 plus. 65 to 84 has over the last 20 years has doubled and over the 85, sorry, uh, it's gone up by one third for between 65 and 84. For over 85 is more than doubled. So, so that's where we're seeing that extended life expectancy. But the big part of today's talk is going to be about healthy life expectancy. So everyone heard of the concept healthy life expectancy? I'm sure you've, you've heard you know, people talking about healthy life expectancy. A very difficult one to measure because it combines two things. It combines life expectancy and it combines the subjective uh, perception of what they perceive as their status of health is. And then there are five sections to that. It's very good, good, average, uh, fair, Bad. So that these are the kind of mainly five elements of how people would describe their health. So it combines that with the life expectancy. So essentially, in a very, very simple term, healthy life expectancy is number of years you'd expect to live in good health, okay, uh, by combining those two factors. So what do you think our healthy life expectancy is in UK, roughly? Come on. Close to the full life expectancy. I've got 72. Anyone else? Four. Good. You're a you're an optimistic bunch if you think it's 72. <laughs> so it's a bit lower than that. Uh, our average healthy life expectancy is about 64, 64, 65. Uh, and actually, uh, when I'm retiring at the moment, it's 67. <laughs> and actually, probably be even. Uh, even even higher but by the time uh, I'm, I'm in my mid-40s now. So just gives, gives a bit of an idea there uh, where it's heading. So healthy life expectancy, there's a big gap in healthy life expectancy. In one of the worst parts of the country, Bradford, 51.6, and uh, Guildford, 71. And our average is about 64, 65 at the moment in, in, the, in, the, uh, in the country. And I think the reason this is important because healthy life expectancy, while life expectancy over the last 30 years have gone up, healthy life expectancy has pretty much remained static. OK, so in other words, where we are, what we are doing is we are adding years right at the end. So in other words, the number of years people live in ill health has gone up over the 30 years significantly. Does everyone get that? Is that? I think it's a really important concept, actually. With me. So we are adding life at the end of the years, uh, and because of that, that has uh, significantly uh, increased. So the aim of today's talk is, is to try and say how can we actually improve healthy life expectancy and not just life expectancy. If you improve healthy life expectancy, you will ultimately improve life expectancy as well by nature of things, but you're adding the years at the right part of your life. So. You would obviously think, of course, we need to do more on lifestyle behaviours because uh, you know, most of the ill health happens because of our classic lifestyle behavioural issues, whether it's smoking, alcohol, obesity, uh, sedentary lifestyle and so on. Um, and I think we went through a lot of the early 1990s and uh, yeah, the North is basically telling people these are the, you know, not, not good thing to do. It's all about education. You know, if you, as long as we tell people what the right thing to do, they will do it kind of approach. Um, and that, that has been, we've had mixed results on that, really. Um, so just to make the case for some of these things very quickly, um, you know, in terms of people who are thinking, can we afford to spend money on these kind of lifestyle behaviours and prevention, as opposed to some of the urgent issues that we have with health at the moment. Um, for every pound you spend on smoke, no smoking intervention, in terms of prevention and in terms of what we do, uh, in improving health outcomes, the returns about 15 pounds. And that applies across. If you look at exercise, physical activity, for every pound you spend, 23 pounds return. Um, but the biggest is, is, is housing, believe it or not. If, you know, if, if for every pound you invest on housing, you get a return of 70 pounds. But the challenge of some of these things is that it, they are, these are longer term. It takes time for this to, this to come through. 
So, uh, I, meant to, I meant to not show that, but anyway, never mind. Uh, so, uh, that, that kind of shows behaviors have a big part to play. How we live our life, uh, our lifestyle behaviors is a big part to play in terms of uh, uh, developing illness and so on. So, another quick question then. Um, what do you think healthcare contributes, the proportion wise, from a, towards the health and well being of a population? Having a good quality healthcare system, how much that contributes towards having good health outcomes? Give me some proportions, shout out. 70%. Sorry? 70%. 70 percent of healthcare system will determine health outcomes. Okay. 60% or 50 percent. 60 or 50 percent. Anyone else from this side of the room? 20. <laughs> You've seen this slide somewhere, haven't you? Know that? <laughs> so um, 20 percent. 20 percent of the healthcare system contribute to your health outcomes. Vast majority of them are to do with your health behaviours, like what we talked about earlier, uh, your socioeconomic factors, your education, employment, income, family support, all these kind of things, and built environment. The rest of the 80% have got nothing to do with healthcare in terms of what is going uh, to, what, what's going to determine your health outcomes. So yet, a big proportion, if you look at the amount of money that's been spent, a massive amount is spent on healthcare at the moment. All right? So I kind of like to capture this in, in, a, in, a, in a simple pyramid you know, uh, 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 fashion. So th there are four tiers to this pyramid. Ultimately, we're trying to prevent illness in the, in the business of healthcare. We're trying to prevent illness. Um, and that means, you know, reducing the number of people developing long term Ill diseases and so on. Um, and big part of that, if you look at why some part of the population gets higher levels of chronic illness compared to other parts of the population, often it's got to do with lifestyle factors. So, you know, there's high levels of uh, smoking, alcohol consumption and so on. And then if you ask the question, why do some parts of the population uh, particularly have higher poor lifestyle factors? It's often to do with mental well-being, people's mental well-being. And I'm not talking about mental health, I'm talking about mental well-being and resilience, the general overall feeling of empowerment to make decisions. Um, so that is, uh, you know, things like social isolation, um, you know, your kind of overall well-being has a big impact on that. And that determines your lifestyle factors. And then if you ask the question, why do some part of our population have got poor mental well-being? A big part of it, none of these are black and white answers. A big part that is determined by your social and wider determinant factors like housing, worklessness, your environment you live in, uh, some of the generational issues. So at the moment, if you think about the spending is happening, it's happening right at that tip of the iceberg, but not necessarily in the, in, in the, in the lower part of the pyramid. Um, but the biggest impact of your health outcome is going to come from there. All right. What I like to call is, is even, even when you look at this pyramid, uh, your kind of lifestyle and illness bits are the, some what we call quick wins. You can actually get, gain quick results. And I think that's one of the reasons why we drive towards those things. But actually, your real drivers for that um, you have your behaviors, your physical activity, your tobacco control, alcohol limits. Your real drivers are coming from here your environment, transport, and housing, and so on. Okay? But here's a, here's the problem is is to do about how long it takes for this intervention to have an impact. We often tend to do things that are quick wins and and where we see results quickly. If I start someone on an antihypertensive medication, um, I can I can see next month and see changes in blood pressure. Easy to measure, easy to see results. Um, but actually, if I change someone's housing conditions. Uh, you know, it's going to take, you, you will see immediate results as well, but that translating into overall improvement in health takes a long time. Um, so some of the bottom of the pyramid, particularly mental well-being and the social and the wider determinants, takes a long time, 12 to 15 years, to, uh, to see the impact of that. But when you see the impact, those impacts are prolonged and makes a significant cultural and syst systematic shift in the health of the population. And I think this is particularly important when you're talking about tackling health inequalities. Okay. 
So I'm going to go past this because I've got a lot of slides. Um, I'm, I'm going to now move on. So that's, that's like the basic principles of, uh, of system working and, and, and what we need to do to kind of move towards improving healthy life expectancy to life expectancy. It's all about not necessarily preventing illness per se, but it's actually about creating a healthy population in the first place and not necessarily dealing with the consequences of unhealthy behaviours. So I'm going to talk a little bit about system and structures. We talked about what makes us healthy. We talked about it's, it's a complex web of things that we come across as we get on with our day-to-day -day life, what we do at work, what kind of work we do, how do we get to work, our transport systems, our families, our connections, all these things matter. Um, and that means having a health system or a healthcare system that actually reflects all those factors. So it would be remiss of me not to talk about public health. <laughs> so uh, what, what do we do within public health? In public health, we mainly focus on the key areas of focus are health improvement and health protection. So as I said earlier, there's a big focus on improving lifestyle factors. So we commission drug and alcohol uh, misuse, uh, substance misuse services. We commission uh, our health visiting, school nursing services, and then services to improve mental well-being and so on. Um, there's also a lot of work on health protection, like COVID, managing a pandemic, uh, improving air quality, noise control, all these kind of things comes under the sort of the health protection element. Um, but one of the new elements of public health is about all about why this is How can we actually improve the conditions in which people live? Um, and that is outside, directly outside. As a director of public health, that's outside my remit. It is actually in the remit of all the other uh, organisations, uh, like the local councils and the district councils, uh, voluntary sector businesses. They all have a part of that. So being a director of public health now, compared to maybe 20, 30 years ago, it's, it's about actually influencing with our authority all the other wider parts of the system to deliver public health which is ultimately better for the businesses themselves, as well as the organisations for their own corporate priorities, uh, and also good for the uh, population's health. So it's, it's about creating that win-win scenario, uh, and it's a very different style of working. So as I said, public health in local government has statutory roles like sexual health um, services, health protection, public health advice, um, health checks from 40 to 74 year olds, everyone gets a health check. So these are the kind of statutory services. And then there are non-statutory services, like some of the lifestyle services we talk about. But I think in Oxfordshire, one of the things that we have really pioneered is how do we actually create a healthy place for our population? Uh, how do we work with planners? How do we work with licensing team? How, we, how do we work with all the other partners to create a healthy place so we can actually improve healthy life expectancy, not just life expectancy? Um, so before I go a bit more into systems, just to just to show that I thought this slide was quite useful. It just captures some of our spending in uh, healthcare spending over the last sort of uh, same period as, as the last 30 years that we talked about from 1980 to 2014. Um, and you can kind of see health spending, healthcare spending as, as, as a percentage of GDP has gone up. Um, and you can see that in the United States it's gone up quite rapidly right at the top. We've got right at the bottom, which is UK, um, which is uh, kind of, I think that we, we saw a little bit of an increase around 2000 when New Labour came into power, kind of pumped up a little bit, uh, but generally always lagged behind if you compare it with that, all, all the OECD countries. Um, but that's healthcare spending. Um, I mean, that's not even, we're not even talking about the spending on preventive elements. These are specifically healthcare spending. And, uh, and at the moment, as it stands, the budget of public health is about between 5 to 10% of the, of the NHS budget. So it's quite, quite, a, quite a small portion. Um, this graph basically shows healthy life expectancy against health expenditure per capita. Um, you would expect healthy life expectancy to be higher if the spending on health is higher. That's, that's a natural thing. But actually, that is true probably for life expectancy. But for healthy life expectancy, you can see it's not necessarily true. You can see particularly US kind of sitting right up there uh, because of that different models of healthcare spending around like insurance models, uh, perverse incentives potentially playing out there. So high spending, but not you don't see the gain that you expect to see in healthy life expectancy. And you can see UK in the, in the middle there. 
And then you see other countries like Spain, Israel, Portugal, Greece, you know, very low spending, very low spending, but actually high healthy life expectancy. And this goes back to some of the points. It's not expensive to improve healthy life expectancy. Some of the preventative interventions, healthy place shaping interventions we're talking about are not expensive things to do. It's about actually how can we mobilize all our system partners to deliver in this space. So this is a very critical time for healthcare system. So we have now seen the development of integrated care system. Has everyone heard of the term integrated care system? You're not allowed to shake your heads. You, you will know it. <laughs> anyway. Anyone else? Yeah, yeah. So I've seen some nods. So just try and get an idea. So, um, so integrated care system is a new new thing that that's happening at the moment. Before that, we had clinical commissioning group. Before that, we had primary care trust. So essentially, we have something like a health authority where the budget for health care system was devolved, and they determine how they spend their money locally. Um, and there was health health authorities worked in partnership with local authorities and local government and other businesses and our other voluntary sector, but that wasn't a legal requirement. One of the first things that happened in the great care system is, is that it followed the ambition of the NHS long-term plan. The, essentially, the, the ambition of the NHS long-term plan is to turn the NHS from a national illness service model to a national well-being model. So it's about prevention, putting prevention at the heart of it. And NHS long-term plan recognized that you cannot do prevention as a health entity on its own. You've got to do that with your partners. So the integrated care system did two things. One, it came together in bigger footprints. So for Oxfordshire, it's Buckinghamshire, Oxfordshire, Berkshire West. So these are the three areas that came together to form the integrated care system, fondly known as BOB. Uh, so the BOB ICS is the term that I use every day. Um, so that's the that's our footprint. So as a footprint, we came together to produce efficiency so we can do things once across a bigger footprint, where they talk about specialist cancer services, especially men mental health services and so on. Some of the very highly specialist things you can do it once across a bigger footprint. But then there was also the, uh, the, the, the importance of bringing other systems together. So at the moment, the healthcare system is very much driven by specialities like mental health, uh, cardiology, um, neurology, and so on. But the patients, you know, you have the one patient who will have all these problems. So it's important that we treat individuals in a more holistic way. So one of the things that the integrated care system has done is join up services, that kind of integration, primary care and secondary care together, uh, so that we can treat patients in a more holistic way. So there's a join up of care. And then the third thing it has done is also it has created a integrated care system which allows other partners to come together and it actually has made that a legal requirement. So you will have social care, public health, local authorities partnering with the NHS to provide the health and care system to our, our residents. And we tend to use now the term residents more than patients because there's something about, you know, not all of the residents uh, are patients all patients are residents, if you, if you think about it. So you will see this term coined around quite a lot. The integrated care system is, is, is a system that brings those partners together. The two terms I just want to introduce is integrated care board. This is a small group. It is the board that decides how the NHS spends the money in, in that area. And the second part is integrated partnership, which is a much bigger group which has not just NHS members, but it has NHS, social care, local authority, elected councillors, uh, politicians and so on, are all part of that and planning to actually address the wider determinants of health that I've talked about. So we're not just looking at it in, in, in health in a silo. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah. So it's trying to do things in a bigger footprint. It's trying to join up health services where relevant and it's trying to bring partners together. Um, to actually ultimately provide a, a better outcome for residents. So you might then wonder what's happening to our place, you know, why what, what is it, you know, what's happening within Oxfordshire? And we do have a place-based partnership as well within Oxfordshire, where 
it mirrors the ICS. So we do, within Oxfordshire, we have our, our acute trust and our primary care units, as well as our uh, local government partners coming together to make decisions locally as well. So that's happening as well at the same time, so that we can provide a service that's more joined up uh, at a local level. Because one of the dangers we have is when you operate at a kind of wider bulk footprint, is that you lose the local focus. So uh, one of the key principles that we have is that delivering a service that is relevant to a population in their local footprint. OK, so it's getting that balance right. Um, these are some of the things I've talked about, understanding what the communities themselves, the communities that we work with, which is very much at a place based partnership level, joining up services, addressing uh, social and economic factors and providing quality local services. These are the main principles of integrated care system. Now, you might be thinking that this sounds like all the other reforms that's gone ahead uh, proceeded. And uh, do you know what? I, 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 I do, there is an element of that. There's no question about it. But I think for me, what this allows is it actually gives a legal framework for the first time that allows me as a director of public health to go to my health partners and say, let's put our money together. Let's put our money together because the things that I do in public health is going to stop number of people coming into your acute systems. So let's look at to a population health management. Why are you getting so many people coming through the through the A&E? Is it because of the primary care provision is not right and we need to fulfill that? Or is it because of the lifestyle behavior is it to do with housing? It has allowed us to have in a very practical level to have those kind of conversations. So that's one good thing about it. But it's got a, it's got a long way to go, and it and it's certainly it's certainly going in the right direction. So that's enough me talking about. I think this is going to test my. Yes. Let me let me try and do this. See if I can get it. <laughs> uh, I've got a small five minutes video which actually kind of sums this up really well. So it will give me a break as well. Uh, so stop sharing is the first thing I need to do. Let me change the speakers, and then. Uh, start sharing and start playing this. These changes are taking place across the health and care system. What does this mean to the organisations that make up the NHS? How will they collaborate with other parts of the system? And what will these changes mean for you and me? When the NHS was set up, it focused on treating single conditions or illnesses. Since then, our health and care needs have changed. More of us are living longer, and many have multiple conditions that require regular, ongoing care. However, this hasn't been reflected in the NHS's structure patchwork of organisations that often work independently from one another. Navigating this can be confusing and can have a negative impact on our experience of care. So, for some years now, health and care staff and leaders have been working to bring organisations closer together to better meet our needs by working in a joined up way. Primary and secondary care, social care, mental health and community health services have been seeking to partner with each other in different ways. At a very local level, GP surgeons have been coming together to form primary care networks, groups of practices working together across areas called neighbourhoods. By sharing resources and working closely together with other local people and services, they can provide a wider range of services than a single GP surgery. Health and care organisations have also been working together across larger areas called places, often covering the same area as a local authority, where large parts of the NHS budget are spent. Here, local government, charities, residents and NHS partners can work together to understand and meet local health needs. But previous laws have prevented services becoming even more joined up. The 2022 Health and Care Act aims to change this, and make it easier for organisations to work together. But what do these changes look like? Organisations are now coming together across even larger areas to form integrated care systems, 
partnerships of health and care organisations that plan and pay for health and care services. There are around 40 integrated care systems across England, and although they've existed for some time, the Health and Care Act gives them legal status, as well as new powers and responsibilities. Integrated care systems are made up of two parts, integrated care boards and integrated care partnerships. Integrated care boards decide how the NHS budget for their area is spent and develop a plan to improve people's health, deliver higher quality care, and better value for money. Integrated care partnerships bring the NHS together with other key partners, like local authorities, to develop a strategy to enable the integrated care system to improve health and well-being in its area. NHS trusts are also coming together to form provider collaboratives, new partnerships that can bring together providers such as hospitals, mental health services and community services. So how are these new structures funded? Integrated care systems get most of their money from NHS England, which is the national body for the NHS in England, and sets the operational priorities for the health system. It's responsible for the health services you and I access day to day, which are inspected and regulated by the Independent Care Quality Commission. The Department of Health and Social Care sets out what the NHS is expected to deliver for the money it gets from the government, which comes from our taxes. It also holds budgets for some of the other areas that have an impact on our well-being, like public health. Throughout these new structures, local authorities play a key role. They receive money locally and from national government, which goes towards funding a range of services that support our well-being and prevent ill health. So, what does this all mean in practice? The Health and Care Act has put in place a legal framework that enables services to work more closely together, so it's easier for you and I to receive the care we need when and where we need it. For these changes to succeed, staff and local leaders will have to work with one another differently, alongside key partners in local government, the voluntary sector, and communities themselves. Of course, Services face other challenges like workforce shortages, growing waiting lists, and the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. While the new structures won't fix all these issues, by enabling services to work more closely together and join up services for patients, it's hoped that the health and care system will be better able to meet our changing health and care needs in the future. Find out more about how the health and care system is changing at www.kingsfund.org.uk slash explain. Right, I hope you find that useful. Um, so uh, what we will do now is first I shall turn this back into the old mode. So stop sharing. Okay, can you all hear me? All right, yeah. Okay. So I think this gives a, just before I go to the second part of my discussion, um, a good point to kind of pause and reflect. Uh, so if you've got any questions, it's not working. So I've done, I clearly haven't done it. Okay, that's right. Yeah, so any any questions and reflections? We'll, we'll we'll try and spend a bit more time in the, in, in, at the end of the presentation as well. But I just wanted to just pause there. Yes, exactly. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, I wanted to know how you measure uh, the healthy life expectancy success if this is such a long term, because most of the funding comes from results, and if this is going to be a very good 10, 20 years. Uh, how how this is measured and, and convince you know, people yeah. to give you the money. No, no, absolutely. And I think this is this is where I'll touch a little bit of research at the end because I think one of the things is that we have to work more effectively through research methodologies to show the effectiveness of some of the longer term interventions that are place shaping, uh, that actually contributes to place shaping. In terms of how we measure healthy life expectancy, now we do uh, the Office of Health 
uh, the, sorry, the ONS now does actually measure healthy life expectancy. It combines uh, a survey that's undertaken every three years, household survey, to, uh, where the questions asked how, how healthy you are. Uh, it looks at that and then it combines with the life expectancy measure uh, to form the healthy life expectancy. Uh, now that's done every three years, not whereas life expectancy is measured every year. So there is a measure we can now see what's happening to healthy life expectancy in a three year cycle. But I think more importantly, what's important is just showing we have a real gap. And I think your question is absolutely <coughs> fundamental. We have a real gap in showing the effectiveness. We know some of the wider determinants the issues that we talk about, whether it's housing, whether it's lifestyle factors, has a massive impact on health outcome. But I think we know that in a, in a global scale, but showing tangible uh, effectiveness based on individual intervention is lacking. And I think that's where we need to kind of move. You mentioned quite reasonably that, you know, healthcare interventions kind of at the top of the pyramid, maybe the time scale is rather shorter than some of the others. But I wonder if one of the other challenges, apart from the longer time scale or changes from the built environment, for example, is just the, the quality of evidence and the assumptions you have to make. So you gave an assumption, for example, just one pound spent saves you 70 pounds, you know, and that may be true, but it may be out by an order of magnitude. So isn't part of the problem how do you generate yeah. better evidence? Because I think if you had truly believable numbers, Quite a lot so I think, I, think, I think at a global level, when, you, when you're trying to get evidence, you need a sample size that's big enough to actually show the statistical significant difference. So some of the uh, evidence that I showed is produced by King's Fund. They've looked at interventions, varying different types of interventions. So the challenge is that you use the notion that one pound spent on improving housing has a 70 pound return, but that actually covers a number of housing interventions. So how do we know? which housing intervention actually will work at a sort of a 90 pound scale and which one will be 50 pounds and which one will be minus 10 pounds. Uh, I think that's, that's the challenge. But in terms of the evidence base, housing improving health, that's there. That, that, that is very, very clear. But it's one intervention within that can be effectively executed is the question. And I think part of that is about local research. So doing things, so there are things that we're doing, which I'll come into in a bit, there are things that we are doing and we are evaluating to show effectiveness of that in, in the short term um, so that we have faith in, in, in certain interventions and we can scale those things up. So there is the, the principles are evidence based, but interventions, there's a massive lack in evidence. I think that's how I would put it. I'll take one more question and I'm going to move on. Because I'm running on time. Uh, last question from the yeah. So, NHS England historically often wants to be cost neutral, but in reality, a lot of interventions are more expensive and more effective. So, to what extent does the new framework take that into account and try and get, a, get away from the cost neutral suggestion? Again, this is short term thinking, isn't it? Some of these things are about um, you know, being able to show that you're able to invest money um, and you get a return in a very short period of time. Uh, but actually what we need is a little bit of commitment and a different way of measuring it. I think the way we measure things are geared towards showing, uh, measuring things that are quantitative rather than qualitative. So we're looking at things that we can measure and, and looking at things in the short term. Actually, if you look at our political cycle, our political cycles are five years and it's driven to us actually making a difference in that space. But actually, what, in, in an ideal world, what we need is a cross-party agreement across, across a 10-year period. Mm -hmm. so that's minimum. And that's yeah, that, that would that would enable us to show some real results. And I think for certain things I absolutely agree we need to have kind of cost neutral approach for certain type of interventions that we should say that we try to achieve. So I think we could operate in a different scale. I suppose different things. There are things like addressing waiting lists and elective care and all those kind of things. We've got to show results fairly quickly because there's no judicial. Well, actually, you've got to ask also the question where these, these uh, where, where are the dishes are coming from, why are they coming from, and, and what's happening upstream. Um, and so, so you, that, have, you, you think you now have the power of this new framework to say actually we need more than five years until we look at research evidence 
working mash against it. Maybe oh, not oh, long oh, term. Well, hold your thought because I'm going to talk a little bit of research if I get some time. So uh, I'll, I'll touch on that at the end, and then if not, we can come back again for the end of the presentation. All right. So I'm, I'm going to move us on because the, the second part of my conversation is going to be on inequalities, and I want to take a look at Oxfordshire. What's happening in Oxfordshire? Uh, and when I started. In, in Oxfordshire, um, one of the first things that struck me is Oxfordshire is one of the most affluent parts of the country. Uh, but actually, uh, compared to where I, where I came from before, which is black country uh, in, in Sandwell, where high level of universal deprivation. So what do we mean by health inequalities? It's the unfair, avoidable differences in health across the population between different groups within society. And there are essentially four dimensions to it. There's socioeconomic deprivation, uh, there's wonderful groups in our society who, who, who have inequality featuring in it. There is protected characteristics like, uh, you know, your sexuality and so on, um, and your ethnicity and so on. And then there's geography, where you live. So these are the four key things that features. Oxfordshire has 725,000 people. Um, Oxfordshire County Council is where I work, where the public health sits at the county council level. But also it has... Uh, five city and district council, Oxford City Council, Whale of Whitehouse District Council, South Oxford Council, West Oxfordshire District Council, and Charlton District Council. District Council has more of those kind of operational responsibilities for like housing, uh, planning, and so on, things like that. So my role is not just working with the county council, my role is also working with the districts and city partners. And as I said, from a health inequalities point, point of view, Oxfordshire 10 least deprived in the country, really good health outcomes. But when I started to dig deep in within that, it does hide some very significant inequalities. There are there are 10 wards, uh, small localities, in other words, which has areas that are in the 20% most deprived in the whole of England. Okay? Uh, so absolutely we need to look at a, we need to look at things in a more local level. Now if you look at Oxfordshire as a whole, whether you look at children in low-income families, um, homelessness, violent crime, whatever it, whatever you look at in uh, employment level, everything looks better than national average. All of them are better than national average. If you look at some of the health outcomes, emergency hospital admissions from various conditions, everything again looks better than national average. You know, but as I said, there are ten wards in Oxfordshire which feature areas that are in the 20% most deprived in England. And these are, the, these are the wards that has the lower super output areas that are in the 20% most deprived. So that's the name of the ward. And that's the code for the lower super output area that features in the 20% most deprived in the country. Now, if I repeat the same indicators I showed earlier, this, this is for Oxfordshire, but if I repeat it for these, these wards, so we essentially I took on one of the wards, Banbury Ruscott. This is the story. Same indicators, everything is worse than national average. Emergency hospital admission, childhood obesity, uh, everything's worse than national average. I think it paints the picture quite strongly that we are, our demand is not coming universally from Oxfordshire. They're coming from certain pockets of areas, certain parts of the communities, uh, and the needs of the health is, is coming from these areas. And that's an example of that. If you then repeat the life expectancy again, you know, Oxfordshire, much better than England, then nine out of our ten wards have got lower life expectancy than, uh, than uh, Oxfordshire and, and national average. So, again, showing you the inequalities. You can apply that to healthy life expectancy as well. Generally, most of the areas have got higher healthy life expectancy than both national and Oxfordshire average. Oxfordshire is a red line. Uh, England is the dark blue line, and then you have the individual districts. When I, when I arrived at Oxfordshire, they would look at things at district level. Yeah, we look at things at district level. It still shows better than national average, but actually you need to go even lower to start to look at board level, then you start seeing the disparities. So these are your 10 most deprived boards, which has got lower healthy life expectancy than, than uh, national average. Again, you left-hand corner, you've got emergency hospital admission from COPD, for an example, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, uh, and you can see Oxfordshire much lower than national average, but if you repeat it for the 10 wards, well above national average. 
And then you can do the same thing for uh, obesity at the age of, uh, at year six, childhood obesity, same picture. So you can repeat the, these indicators to any of those things. So I've got basically five indicators there. Children obese at year six, admissions due to injuries in uh, between 15 to 24, hospital stays, alcohol-related harm, uh, and emergency admission from COPD. If you look at those things, you've got the red box there saying yes, which means it's worse than national average. Okay, you would not get that picture if you repeated oxygen level. That's why getting granular level data so that we can actually have those discussions with the integrated care system. We can have those discussions with the voluntary sector. We can have those discussions with the, with the, uh, with the uh, businesses and, and so on to, to make a difference to these, 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 these areas and people who are living in these areas. Again, education skills, childhood poverty, the list goes on. And when COVID happened in 2020, I remember doing an interview in COVID and I launched my first director of public health annual report in 2020, which was meant to be released in 2019. And it was on inequality. I, I wrote it before COVID and I had to launch it halfway through the pandemic in 2020. And everyone was shocked to understand why our most deprived areas got the highest level of COVID infection and comorbidities from the infection. And I was saying, no, it's not a surprise. It's been happening for decades after decades, whether you look at cancer outcomes, whether you look at cardiovascular disease outcomes, the same areas, the same individuals, same groups of communities have, have, have suffered disproportionately. Uh, and we are now seeing that playing out in COVID infection. It's not a new thing. Um, so, so, so it just shows the level of inequality in Oxfordshire. So I think one of the things we have to do is there's a lots of good work that's happening in Oxfordshire, uh, but it's happening universally. They're not being targeted in our most deprived areas. And that is why it's really important to kind of bring that bit in there, promoting well-being, well -being, and particularly doing, creating a healthy place in our most deprived areas. And the prevention spectrum shows that, you know, it's a spectrum. There are things that you can do to delay people need for care. Uh, there are things that you can do to reduce the impact of disease, better screening, better diabetic screening. And there are things that you can actually target towards residents who haven't stepped into a GP practice, but actually keeping them healthy. So that, that's a bit, so it's a prevention spectrum. The prevention goes all across the spectrum and different organization and different people in all walk of life will have a role to play within it. I want to talk a little bit of healthy place shaping and I'll spend five minutes on that and then we can open up to questions. So healthy place shaping is essentially a principle that was, uh, we had 10 healthy new towns in, in the country uh, in 2016. And two of those were in Oxfordshire, Barton and Bicester. I don't know if any of you heard of those. So Barton and Bicester were the two new healthy towns. And since then, Oxfordshire has been a really pioneering for creating a healthy place that actually built thriving communities better healthy behaviours, a sense of belonging, sense of community integration. And that is the principle of healthy place, place shaping. So there are three principles of healthy place shaping. The first one is built environment, you know, improving the environment, uh, physically changing the environment. The second one is community activation, which is about once you've built a physically built a better environment, how do we activate the community? How do we engage the community to uh, take up some of those healthy behaviours? And the third one is developing new models of care. So those are the three principles, and you can see some of the works here uh, that, 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 that we can do in each of those areas. You can, you, can, you, can, you can build a really nice cycle lane, but if you don't activate the communities, no one will cycle in the cycle lanes. So that's the classic example. Okay, um, and it needs to happen at neighbourhood, town, district level, county, as well as the integrated care system. It needs to happen at every level. We have done some great stuff in Barton and Bicester, but our next challenge is how can we apply that to our most deprived areas that I've talked about? We talked about the 10 walls, how can we apply that in those, those areas? And it, and it involved working in partnership with a multitude of organisations. So, so our lead for this is a, it's a lady called Rosie Rowe. It's her slides, I have to give credit. And, and she, you can see here the number of organizations we have, uh, we have kind of integrated with to deliver the healthy place shaping initiatives. So some examples, we talked about built environment, promoting access to green spaces, creating community where it's easy to walk and cycle and so on. Community activation, I've talked about how can we actually encourage people to change their behavior, to take the opportunity 
uh, whether it's uh, better, better health and well-being at work, or whether it's integrating more with the local community groups and so on. Uh, and then uh, encouraging, you know, there are, there, you, can, you can actually ask people, you know, expecting people to go to gym five days a week is not a model that is sustainable. We have to create an environment where it's automatic. Everything that we do will make them more physically active so they don't have to think about it. And that is the principle of healthy place shaping. Um, and then new models of care. So this is about actually, you know, having patient experts, virtual wards, um, you know, using social media in, in a productive way. It's not necessarily about walking to a building to access a, a, a GP or a, or, a, or a medical profession. There are different ways of delivering things uh, within the community. So some examples here in Oxfordshire, we've done school streets, which is about we've had nine school streets, a pilot, nine schools taken apart on school street pilot, where people, families walk to school in those areas. There's wayfinding projects, creating park and, and stride wayfinding routes to primary schools, so walking through parks and so on. And then there's street tags, which increases the, the frequency of children taking up physical activity, walking and cycling in a more competitive way. Um, and, and there are some really good examples that we've already seen. We've delivered more than 7,000 um, in, in 21, 22, just at, you know, in the middle of COVID. We've delivered more than 7,000 participants who take part in street tag, uh, nine schools take part in uh, school streets. Um, and, and, and from active travel research, we have found that this is actually making a difference. Uh, we, we particularly did, we did research in our in our most deprived areas like Barton and Blackford Lees. We've also uh, did a survey in our, our Bain population uh, to see if they're taking up these, these offers, and we've seen some positive results. And it only cost us 360,000 pounds, just to give you an example, really simple measures. And these are some of the examples. And, and we had a visit from Chris Vitti, who came to see us to see some of the things that we are doing around bikeability and how we're actually encouraging our young people and, and communities from the black and ethnic minority to, to take up cycling opportunities and so on. So one of the things I just want to talk about is, is one of the projects we didn't, did was something called Better Housing, Better Health. So before, this was about calling uh, the, 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 the families who are experiencing poor housing conditions and trying to address the issues related to housing. We've changed this from a phone call to a visit now. So we would visit the housing, but we would not only address the housing issues, but we would address the well-being issues within that and make appropriate referrals. And there has been some significant referrals, not just to health, health and care system, but also to social issues and debt reliefs and things like that, um, as well as addressing housing issues and improving full uh, poverty issues and so on. So there's been some significant, this is a piece of project that we are evaluating, and we're doing a piece of evaluation where we're trying to show the effectiveness of these kind of intervention in reducing hospital admissions. So the key challenge with all this is, is, is research. It goes back to the question you asked, and I'm just gonna finish off with this. We are really good at doing clinical research. We've done this for years, and, and actually, we're really good at measuring it. But what we need to do is this research within local government is really lacking in these kind of areas. So we are for, there are a number of areas that we are doing this in Oxfordshire. Better housing, better health is one of those examples. We're also doing a specific research on retrofitting to see the impact of retrofitting and the overall well-being. But that requires data sharing. That requires data sharing between local government, social care, and health, so that we can actually see the impact. So we are one of the national example sites for building on a project called Open Safely, um, and and actually then doing this to benefit local government research. Um, as I said, clinical research measures treatment outcomes, care pathways, and that's been a real success story. We are one of the world leaders for that. We now need to apply the same principle to public health research. And we have, as a council, we have applied to become a health determinant research council, which means that there are some, there are, there are ten, uh, there are roughly, roughly around ten sites at the moment across the country, where they specialise in providing health determinant research to tackle health inequalities and so on. Um, we have applied it through NIHR, um, and if we were to be successful, we will become a centre of excellence, for example. But we do need a change in culture. We do need an approach for research that we've applied to our clinical areas and to our academic areas within the local government settings. Um, and I think that will help to answer some of the questions that you talked about earlier and actually address some of the really 
systemic, wider determinants issues that are really impacting on health inequalities. Right, I'm going to stop there. That's been a bit of a whistle stop tour, but I just want to give a, a few minutes just to reflect and ask any questions. Um, the aim is not to get into detail of any of these things, but just to give you a flavour of some of the work that's happening within public health and local government, and also give you a flavour of prevention means a lot of things, and actually the approach that we are taking within Oxfordshire. Happy to take any questions.